Simon Brown with his socks. He's still happy. Um, yeah, yeah, on stage the year 2016 and going forward into 2017. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy. Thanks, and poor e evening, uh, ladies and gents. So we've got a chunk to get through. I always start any predictions with this, and that's my caveat. That, and it really does. It tells you more about the person making the prediction than the prediction. Because let's be honest, my ability to see the future is exactly the same as anybody else's, the, the, which is, in truth, zero. We don't have any crystal balls. The, 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 the key thing is, and why is it moving on me, is that recency bias. So, and that's the tough part of predictions. One of the huge failings in humans is that we, we misunderstand how strong trends are and how long they can continue. Uh, and, and we've seen many examples over the years, and I'll touch on some of them during the course of this evening. It's a brave person who calls an end to a trend. And we see it all the time. I mean, there's always someone on TV who will stand up and tell you that the world is ending tomorrow or whatever the case is. Um, but it's, it's that recency bias which says, well, it's been doing this. Does it continue? And that's really the challenge in it. So in some places this evening, I'm going to say it's the same old, same old. What's going to be more important is when I think things are going to change, and that's where I'm going to really focus my time on. But before we go anyway, I'm going the wrong direction. I, you know, the other point around this, and this is something I'm always very big on, is if I'm going to stand up here and make predictions, I've got to come back a year later and mark what I said a year ago. Otherwise, there's far too many people putting ideas into the ether and frankly disappearing and taking no responsibility for what they said a year ago. So I come back, this is I think the fourth one I've now done, I come back every year and I look at what I said last year. And in the, in the, in the big picture space last year, I pretty much got it right. Uh, the exception being I, I, th I thought Hillary Clinton would beat uh, the Bushman at the election. Um, at that point, you know, Trump was around already, but really he was a, a, a I mean, how do we politely say he was a joke? Um, we don't. He is a joke. The point is, he was there already, but no one thought anything was going to happen. It really looked like a Clinton-Bush election, and uh, ended up being a Trump-Clinton uh, uh, election, and well, we know what happened there. And I thought the Indy would continue to do better this year, and the industrial Indy 25 really was a disappointment. Um, I called the rant. If you remember last year, it was a Monday evening. I gave my predictions. Everything was lovely. And then on Wednesday evening, suddenly we got a new finance minister. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Except that it made one of my predictions right. I said the RAND will get stronger unless something crazy happens. And you folks will admit that if three finance ministers in four days is something crazy happened. And I got my 16 bucks and change on the RAND. ESCOM is sorted. Politics is messy. I say local politics. That's being polite to everyone else. Politics globally is messy. And that's not new to 2016. That's just what politicians do best. Uh, the drought is, is, the rain is returning. Uh, oil remains weak. Uh, top 40 was negative. GDP disappointing. Uh, I'll come back to commodities. And as I always say, don't worry about a crash. A crash will happen. A crash will ruin your day, it will ruin your week, it will ruin your year, but the folks who are predicting the crashes, yeah, I mean, there's one oak out there who predicted the crash of 86 um, and every other crash since then, except he doesn't. He just basically, every morning, wakes up and says, today the market will crash. And when it does, he tells you about it. But, uh, yeah, so, you know what, markets crash, don't stress that at all. So on that level, I did brilliant. I mean, loads of green, not much red. And that's really nice, but that's not where the rubber hits the road. The rubber hits the road on stocks. And I didn't do so nice on the stocks, to be perfectly frank. Uh, Richmond, terrible. Discovery, terrible. Capitec, famous brands, lovely. Colgro, terrible. Aspen, terrible. Santova, terrible. DBX, terrible. And the market as a whole, down 1%. Those are as of close yesterday, going back 12 months. I haven't taken calendar or anything. I'm going back a full 12-month period. Includes dividends. I mean, in truth, that's an embarrassing slide. My only defense I have is that I pick stocks, you know, 12 months for me is not an investable period. Um, and I, owned, uh, I own all of those except Aspen. I'm not a big fan of the, of the drug makers. Um, and most of them I've been buying. So, you know, the price is down, if anything, are opportunity. But patently, I got the stocks very wrong, except for the commodities. I got the commodities very, very right. And there is a caveat. What I said last year, when I was standing here at this presentation, as I said quite simply, is you buy the commodity stocks when they've bounced 100%. In other words, wait for them to double in value, and then you buy them. 
And I think pretty much to a person, you all assumed I was the craziest person you'd ever heard speak in the history of speaking. Except that that's what you do with crazy, volatile stocks that have been beaten down to a pulp. You wait for them to double in value. Kumba went to 25 rand. You buy it at 50, it went to 180, it's still 150. Its total return is 362. But, so the commodities, I did get right. And, 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 and the ones I looked at was uh, Kumba, was Anglo, and Billiton at 47%, which on this chart would be beautiful, but on that chart, 47% is positively boring. Uh, and I will talk more about commodities. So that was what we spoke about a year ago. So now what do we talk about this year? There's a general consensus out there that this has been one of those, you know, in, in, in time when people you know, talk around 2016, it's going to be in hushed voices. Um, you know, between David Bowie, Leonard Cohen, Donald Trump, Brexit, and everything else in between, it's been, it's been a year of, of heckedness. Uh, fortunately, my holiday starts in about 52 minutes when I finish talking. Um, and then the year can do whatever it wants. So let's go looking forward. The first is the RAND. Um, I, I am very much of the view. So there was that move to 16, which got me the tick on the first slide. Um, monthly chart going back to 1990. I think the RAND is going to move stronger for a couple of reasons. First is we've had, you can see the crazy moves higher. It blows out occasionally, um, but the RAND typically then comes back. How much stronger depends how long. And I'm not saying it's going to happen in December or even January. This is a trend that will play out over a couple of years. Those of you who remember December 2001, we had 1361 on the Rand. It then got back to 575, but it took all of four or five years to do it. Um, and then it blew out again. And it took, you know, it, it, was, it was almost 13 years before it got back to those 2001 levels before it breached the 1361 again. That was an extreme move. The one there is 2008, that was more of a global concern. And then really the move of late last year was, it's our own doing. We, we shot ourselves in the foot, uh, both of them, and then we just fired some random shots around because we can. Um, but my, you know, and you look at that and you say, it, 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 ah, the trend is weak. I get it, the trend is weak, but I think we're gonna see Rand coming back. The key, issue with that, of course, is that if, if America is suddenly more attractive and they're raising rates uh, and Donald Trump will apparently spend a whole lot of money uh, and cut taxes and make the banks less regulated, etc., we will see money flow into the U.S. and into U.S. dollars, and that obviously has a negative impact on our currency. Absolutely, it does. But I think if we look through that to a sense, you know, no story runs forever. Donald Trump's going to get the, the keys to the, the, to the White House on, on 20th of January, and he's going to find it a little harder to do a lot of what he wants to do and how he wants to do it. And I think we'll see some of that shine come off. And then the story goes, as always, is that search for yield. Where's that search for yield? And the search for yield is emerging markets. And who are our competitors in emerging markets? Uh, Turkey, where they arrest professors, for goodness sake. Um, Russia where, I mean, I don't know, Vladimir Putin, I, I'm not saying anything bad about him because he just scares the heck out of me. But those are the sort of folks, and Brazil and Vietnam and Cambodia and others, I hear that. But in the space of emerging markets, we are quite high on that list. There's one critical thing to understand. The foreign investor investing into Johannesburg doesn't care about our politics, our GDPs, or anything like that. They don't care who is the COO of the SABC. They don't care who's the president of the country. They look for one simple thing, risk-adjusted return. Can they make money? They will invest anywhere. They just want to know if they can make money. And at some point, South Africa becomes attractive enough, both our equities and our bonds, and they will flow in and buy. I think a lot of the flow is going to go into our bond market because we're still very attractive yields, even with yields rising in, in Europe and, and, and uh, North America to a degree. But I think we'll see flow into the equities. Where exactly is it? So I extended that green line all the way, and it's somewhere between 9 and 10 Rand 50 sometime over the next four to five years. We're going to see that strengthening. I think the Rand will certainly get below 13. It'll get below 12. It'll get below 11. Will it break 10? It might. That's not going to happen in 2017, but I think we're going to see some Rand strength coming through over the next couple of years going forward. 
Uh, and then our, uh, the ANC will have an election, elective conference next year in Kimberley uh, during December. Uh, Jacob Zuma cannot be re-elected because of term limits within the ANC constitution. So it will probably be Sora Mopoza or Nkosasana Glamini Zuma. I'm not putting money on either. I am far too smart to bet on politicians. Um, the key point is expected to be massively messy, exceedingly dirty. We remember the run-up to Polokwane. We've been down this road before. We remember the, the 2012, the 2007 elective conferences. Tons and tons and tons of noise. And really, as I said, the international investors don't particularly care. Um, there will be a new ANC president by Christmas next year. That then becomes interesting because, of course, then you've got two centers of powers. You've got a president of the ANC and a president of the country, and they are different people. The, the, the way they dealt with that last time this happened was under Thabo Mbeki, and they recalled him. Understand, President Zuma cannot be recalled at the moment. He cannot be recalled. The ANC constitution has no capacity to do this. They have disciplinary processes, but they are cumbersome and slow. Remember Julius Malema. Um, so he's probably there until the end of the year, and then there will probably be a recall happening in 2018. But don't stress it. Politicians, they do what they do. We don't particularly like any of them. So let's look at South Africa itself. GDP, uh, the GDP is improving. But you know what? When your GDP is half a percent, it's hard not to improve. You know, I mean, all you've got to do is buy all the ministers and other fancy luxury German sedan, and boom, your GDP will then tick up a bit. I am bullish in the top 40. I am bullish in the top 40 for 2017. I would have been more bullish if we got a downgrade. I'll explain that in a moment. But there are a couple of reasons, and I'm going to say quickly, NASPAS is a risk. Why is NASPAS the risk? Because it is 17% of the top 40. So if NASPAS continues its fall and falls off a cliff, things start to look very, very ugly for the top 40. And that will, you know, I'm not going to caveat and say top 40 x NASPAS. I take it with all of its pain and fun and everything else. Um, I don't think NASPAS is going to fall off a cliff. Uh, Ten cent is real. It does make money. But look at that chart. We've gone nowhere in three years. Well, it'll be three years in March. Two years and nine months, which is, what, 33 months, we've pretty much gone sideways in the market. We're now pretty much sitting at the bottom of that range, which is brilliant for my timing. If we'd been at the top of the range, it would have been less. But we're sitting at the bottom of that level. There are two ways that stock markets correct in value. They crash or they go sideways. What we've seen with 33 months of sideways movement is we've seen the earnings increase over that 33-month period. Not brilliantly. There hasn't been, we're not talking, I wouldn't even say 20% increase per year. Maybe the top 40 has done maybe low double digits, 11 or 12% growth per year. But you roll that over three years, you compound it, you've got a 40 45% increase in earnings and a price that has gone sideways. That is a correction in time rather than a correction in price. So our market is cheaper. I know the concerns around price earnings, etc. Again, with NASPAS being 17% of your index and a price earnings of somewhere around 100, of course it looks expensive. But we've seen that, that correction happen. Um, and the question then, is the bad news all in? And if we'd got downgraded by Standard & Poor's on Friday, I would have said absolutely the bad news is all in, and then we are Brazilian. Unfortunately, Standard & Poor's was nice to us and didn't. So this is Brazil, going back to uh, beginning of last year. There is the first downgrade to junk from Standard & Poor's, still some more weakness. Then Fitch downgraded to junk. Then Standard & Poor's stuck the boot in a second time. And then Moody's downgraded, and then the market went insane. That's a market that had 34,000 points and is now trading up at 60-odd thousand. And then just for the heck of it, they impeached their president. <laughs> you know what they're doing now? Having impeached their president in August, they're trying to impeach the new president. <laughs> you see my point about politicians? They're the same the world over. The thing with markets, remember they look forward. Markets don't care what's happening today or tomorrow. The market cares what's happening December next year, first quarter of 2018, never mind 2017. And if we start looking forward, so the caveat is the downgrade. Let's quickly touch on the downgrades. So standard and put, the, the way the downgrade agencies work, they are, they are full of, I've got a slide, it's not there. Uh, I'll come to it in a bit. The way they work, if they put you on negative, they've got to downgrade you within two years or put you back to stable. 
which means that in June of next year, we're going to have the whole song and dance again. Are we going to get downgraded? And if that doesn't happen, then in December, we'll have the whole song and dance again. Are we going to get downgraded? I think having survived not being downgraded this year, I think we can get away with it. I think we can get away with it. There's still a chance. Here's why I think we can get away with it. One of their biggest concerns has been GDP growth. We had no GDP growth this year. We will have better GDP growth next year. Not brilliant, but we will have better. If they are concerned about our politicians, what more can our politicians possibly do? And maybe I lack imagination. <laughs> but what more can our politicians do that they didn't do in 2016? I ask you. I mean, so I've got a strong sense that, yes, they're still hanging over our head. But I think we're not going to get all those crazy red arrows. Maybe the, well, we don't, we don't even impeach presidents in this country. It's not in our constitution. We cannot impeach a president. So, that's, so maybe we don't get these red arrows. What I'm using this chart to say to you is that the bad news is in. Surely the worst is behind us. Darkest before the dawn. All those sort of cliches. I look at our economy. I look at what's happening there. We've got commodities have come back. Whether they lost, we'll touch on that. But that's going to help us. That's going to bring currency into the, into the country because they trade it in, in US dollars, et cetera, et cetera. Our politicians have done everything they can to, 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 to destroy our country, and we survived the process and the like. I think downgrades are out. I think with that in the news and a, a three-and-a-half-year consolidation, moving into a four-year consolidation, my head on the block is 2017 top 40 will be higher in a year's time from where it is right now. The rain a year ago, the worst drought in, I don't know, 100 years, 200 years, whatever it was, the worst drought since forever. Rainfall is returning. We live in Joburg here. We had those floods a couple of weeks ago. Definitely we're starting to see the rain come back. The dams are starting to fill up. It'll take two to three years for those dams to return back to normal levels. So restrictions and the like are still going to be in place, but we're seeing the rain come back. The beauty of growing companies, uh, Tongart, Quantum, companies that grow things and then sell them, maize, sugar, etc., is that as much as it's cyclical and it goes to the extremes, weather is the one thing that goes back to the mean. You know, we can argue that construction may never return to the 2010 levels. There's lots of, you know, the commodities that will never return back to the, the prices of, 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 of 2007, 2008. We can make a compelling case there. But what you know is that when, when you get drought followed by rain. Now, global warming, etc., but global warming is not a 2017 issue. That's a little further down the road. The rain has come back. There are a couple of ways we can try and benefit from it. The best is the growers, the Tongots, the Crook Brothers, the Quantum Foods, those sort of folks out there who had a really, really, really bad last year and are going to have a better this year simply because the rain returned. Just as simple as that. Um, you can go to the food producers. I don't like food producers, but certainly they've had the margin squeeze. They've had actually margin squeeze from two directions. In the one sense, the growers try to pass on costs, and if you had maize as an input, the price went up because of the drought, etc. And then your other squeeze came from the retailers. Whitey Besson said, I want to buy your baked beans, but I need a sharper pencil, a better price. I don't like food producers at all. I think they're caught in the middle. Uh, and then we've got the retailer stocks. The retailers will do better. Uh, inflation is moderating. That's not great, but they're going to have... They're going to have the products coming through. The, the, the pioneers, for example, their wheat picks will cost them less to produce because the cost of wheat will be lower. And don't get me wrong, ShopRite know that the cost of wheat is down, therefore that the cost of wheat picks is down, and therefore they're going to say to Pioneer, we want to sell your wheat picks, but we want a better price. Are they going to pass that price to us? Well, just enough to get us interested. But they're going to leave enough fat on that bone for the shareholders. My two picks there, Tongart, own it, ShopRite, own it. Tongart, I was buying around the 116 to 118, and then it ran away from me. It's now around 130. Uh, if it doesn't come back, that's fine. I'm going to start looking at Quantum. I've been wanting to buy Quantum, but I wanted to get this presentation out of the way first. Quantum is chickens, oddly enough, eggs, uh, which had a really bad period, and then uh, uh, the farming business. Your note with both Tongart and Quantum, they've got different legs they stand on. Quickly touch on Tongart. The first is starch. 
cremora and stuff like that. And pretty much that's a bulletproof industry and off it goes. The second is sugar. Sugar went way down to about 145 million at headline level uh, and it should rebound into the, next, into the next year to around five, six, seven hundred million. The third leg is property. Property was hugely disappointing in the last set of results, but property is lumpy. You know, you've got to sign deals, you've got to get land converted, it takes longer. That will self-correct itself coming through and then kick through. Uh, and then ShopRite, anything below 200 Rand, I'm a huge fan of ShopRite. It's on the lowest price earnings it's been in an age. It's on a forward PE of about 18 and a half. That's not cheap, but you're never going to find ShopRite cheap. It's one of those companies that doesn't do cheap. Well, it does if it's selling you baked beans, but not on the share price. So there's my rating agencies. Uh, so this is where we sit now. We've got Moody's two notches above. We've got S&P confused. Understand the distinction. What we were being threatened with downgrade is our non-ZAR denominated debt. Yeah, I know. In other words, US dollar and euro debt, of which it's about 12% of our total debt holding. But they've got us one notch above, and then Fitch dropped us one notch above to negative as well. I think we can get through it. It's still, you know, I, I was running, I, I've been saying 62% chance, or between 52 and 62% chance of a downgrade last Friday from Standard & Poor's. Didn't happen. I've now remitted that down to probably about a 30% downgrade sometime during 2017. So short answer, I'm expecting not to see us downgraded during the course of the year. It does unfortunately leave uncertainty, but if they've got to change, those negatives have either got to go down or up to stable. I think they'll leave us notch below, above junk, but make us stable in that process. Industrials, Indy 25 had a shocker of a year. This has been the index. Post the crisis of 2008-9, the Indy 25 was the index to own. It's the only one that you particularly wanted. It had a horror year for a bunch of reasons. Uh, namely, I mean, we can run through them. Uh, Richmond, MTN, Mr. Price, Steinhoff, and uh, Woolies are all sitting in there. And then, of course, NASPAS at 32% of the ND25. If you buy ND25, you're basically, you put 100 bucks in, you put 33 rand into NASPAS. That doesn't make me comfortable. And I'm not making a comment on NASPAS. It's like if I buy an index of 25 shares, how come one of them is a third of the index? That's the methodology. The way around it is to buy equal weighted indices. I'll touch on that in a bit as well. Um, I think we're going to start seeing some bounces. Steinhoff has already started to bounce. Uh, although, you know, does two days make a bounce? Yeah, I mean, if you hold it, it certainly does. But uh, Steinhoff started to come. Woolies, we've seen bounce a bit as well. I'm going to come back to Woolies. We'll park that there. Mr. Price and MTN. MTN, I have no interest in whatsoever, uh, aside from their inability to be a decent, uh, to have good quality management. And I appreciate they have changed all the management. But really, that horse is so far bolted that, you know, their, their other issue is that what is MTN? They're a data provider at the end of the day. Really, they're a utility. They're still trying to pretend they can sell high-value services. Yeah, nice. No, they like water. They like electricity. They need to, and it's the same with Vodacom. They need to completely rejig their businesses. They will go kicking and screaming, but it will happen in time. I'm waiting for it to happen in time. Um, uh, Richmond, people will tell you that uh, because the Chinese can't do bribery anymore, there's no more watch sales, and that people now wear Fitbits and not Cartiers. I'm sorry. The person who's buying a Cartier doesn't care how many steps they walked. And if they do care, <laughs> if they do care how many steps they walked, they'll employ someone to walk behind them and count. <laughs> You do not buy a Cartier to tell the time. You buy a Cartier to show your friends. You know I don't wear a watch because I have a long sleeve suit on. If I had a Cartier, I'd be here in t T-shirt. <laughs> Is it tough selling overpriced watches right now? You betcha. Partly because your biggest market was Paris, and Paris has had a tough year with the terror attacks and the like. But to tell me that rich people don't want to flaunt their wealth going forward in this planet is, no, come on. Rich people want to flaunt their wealth. And a nice big fancy watch on your arm, coupled with a nice big red car, is about, well, the watch is an easy way to, the problem with the Ferraris is you're prone to crash them. And you've got no space for your kids. So you wear the Cartier, or whatever it might be. Richmond will come back. So I'm expecting bounces in 20, Indy 25. Uh, construction and manufacturing, leave them alone. 
Construction is a mugs game. What is your single competitive advantage against your competitor in construction? I'm cheaper than you. Yo, but that's not a fun place to be. So what do you do? Eventually, you just take your margins lower and lower and lower until you get to zero. And then what do you do? Well, then you sell your, 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 your local construction business. And so, so what you do is you go overseas. You go to Australia. And what do you find in Australia? Well, you find all the other South African construction companies. You find South African, uh, Australian construction companies. You also find uh, Chinese, Italian, Brazilian, and Spanish construction companies. And what's the difference? I'm cheaper than you. Back in the day, 60s, 70s, 80s, the difference was that you might have skills which were not readily available. But that was partly because the skill existed, but it was living in a different continent. Now you just put that skill in a plane, you fly them to Australia, you've got the skill in sight. Construction is a, is a, is a mug's game. You can trade them, but they certainly don't belong in long-term portfolios. And manufacturing, yes, but not in our economy, not at this point of our economy. In time, when our economy is doing 6% GDP growth and things are booming, we can look at what's left of our manufacturing industry. Um, until then, if you want to touch anything in manufacturing, make it chemicals. Rolfs or Omnia? and probably Rolfs. Financials, start at the bottom. Date your bank's not going bust. Because you can't allow the largest bank in Germany, the third largest bank in Europe, and the 11th largest bank in the world to go bust. We learned that lesson in 2008. Um, Date your bank will survive. Is it toxic? Yeah, for sure. Has it got problems? You bet yeah. Uh, is it going to be profitable going forward? Who knows? Not important. It will survive out. The banks had a really good 2016, helped in large point by three finance ministers in four days last year, which absolutely killed them and gave them a nice low base to work off. The banks are cheap. If you look at them price to book, they are cheap. If you look at them at price earnings levels, they are cheap. Banks are cheap by almost any metric. I don't like banks. Simple reason. In the local industry, they've got bad debts arising. We've seen the NPLs, non-performing loans, the start are ticking up. They well, they're not going to get back to the 08, 09 levels. The banks are much more careful about their lending. It's an important point. They have to be more careful about their lending because of legislation. The biggest issue with banks is compliance, is regulation, and the cost associated with it. And that is a huge cost in terms of a direct line cost. It's also a huge drag on profitability. The traders come and they say, we've got this brilliant idea to make money. And the compliance people say, no. And they say, but what if? And the compliance people just say, no, no, just go away. Just go away. You can't make money because then you might lose money. Or someone might sue us. Banks are a different game. The problem with the legacy banks, high costs. You want to buy a bank? Capitec. Simple as that. Signia, I like, it's expensive. So Signia will wait for the price to come right. It's a long way from doing that. The results that we saw just recently indicated that it is uh, Signia on a 30 PE is completely insane. This is a low margin business. It should be on a 12 PE. Don't tell that to Magda. She will hunt you down. So banks, sure. I mean, if you want, I own Capitec. I'm happy with Capitec. It's expensive. I would like to buy it at 400. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, as the results come through, that 400 level will increase. But are the banks cheap? Yes. Is there money to be made there? Yes. I don't like them. I don't like the risks involved in them. I think they're going to struggle over long term. I think their, their days of 20, 30, 35% headline earnings per share growth are, are history. Banks are going to become those stodgy things that do 10, 12, 13% headline earnings growth in a good year, and in a bad year do 5, 6, 7 headline earnings per share growth. Retailers, this is finally the year when it went south. Forever, people have been saying the retailers are expensive and they're going to crash. Well, they were right. It's just six or seven years later than most of us told. Um, cotton on and HMM in part. New legislation from the National Credit Act where you now have to prove what the person earns. In the past, you could just walk, walk in and say, I earn X. And they would say, well, that's very nice. Lovely. We can give you. Now you've got to bring a payslip. And there's two problems with payslips. Firstly, a lot of people don't earn X. They earn a lot less than X. Uh, and the second issue, a lot of people don't get payslips. 
taxi drivers, informal people, they don't get pay slips. They can't show what their thing is. And no longer can you just show three months of bank statements. You need a pay slip. Also, Cotton On and H&M really taught our retailers, and don't get me wrong, Mr. Price, Truvers, the Fashini Group are as good as you will find anywhere in the world. Yet they had global competition come to their backyard and kick their butt. I don't think that they're game over, but I do think that the fight is real, and I think the level of profits and growth that we have come to expect from our clothing retailers is no more. I think it's a different environment going forward, absolutely. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I think we've got potentially more downside. I think we need a significant re-rating. They've been rated on 30 PEs, which means, quite frankly, is you expect their earnings to double every, earnings to double every three years. That is no longer possible. It has happened in the past. It is not happening in the future. What Cotton On and HMM have done have, have the retailers were all very clever. They fought in different areas. So Mr. Price did cash, low quality, that sort of thing. And now they've got direct competition. They will survive. They will make profits. But those giant fat profits they used to make, gone. Thank you very much. No longer around. Uh, for low income, it's always ShopRite. And in fact, the, the best stock for the African story remains ShopRite. Woolies. So Woolies is on a forward price earnings of 13. Last time it was at level was September 2009. The share price was 15 bucks. Is Woolies going to fall more? I honestly don't know. But what we're looking at here is an opportunity that has come across twice in the last decade to buy Woolies at low double-digit price earnings. I have been buying. I was buying at 82.50. 78.50, 74.50, 68.50. I bought some on Monday at 62.50. Uh, and then because of you, I bought Terence, I bought some more just hot an hour ago at uh, whatever the market was, I think 65 Rand. I have so many woolies, I'm going to get a board seat sometime soon. <laughs> Which is really cool because I hope they serve chuckles at the board meetings because, man, <laughs> chuckles are special. So Woolies does, food, uh, does clothing. The clothing is taking some pressure from the Cotton Ons and H&Ms, agreed. Woolies does food, taking some pressure because the rich people are shopping down at ShopRite. You can tell the ex-Woolies shoppers, right? They go to their local ShopRite, but they take Woolies packets. <laughs> well, so that the neighbor doesn't know where they're shopping. It's bad enough they've got to shop down. They don't want the neighbor knowing it's tough times out there. Um, to me, Woolies is one of the, the really, really juicies. Is it going to go lower? I don't know. I'm just saying that in, 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 in five or ten years' time, when we're sitting here, when you're talking to your buddies and you're saying, I remember Woolies at 65 Rand, they're not going to believe you. The other quick point on Woolies is that we look at retails broadly. The whole retail sector has come down, except for pick and pay, which just boggles my mind. I've been telling people to sell that stock since 2004, and I've been wrong <laughs> forever. But what you see is they all forward price earnings of 19, 20, 21. Willys is the outlier. Forward PE, 13. Yes, Australia is a challenge. You know what? When a company does a merger or a big acquisition, and they tell you about how lovely it's going to be, and how much profit it's going to make, and how quick it's going to make the profit, they are lying to you. Every merger that's happened in the history of mergers takes longer and has less synergies. There's actually a Harvard, review, Harvard Business Review report that says 86% of mergers, the companies were better off if they didn't. I do think Woolies is in the 14%, but it's, it's, it's tough. Mergers are tough. They always are. The synergies are never as great as we expect them to be. But what does it do? It gives us opportunity. I was chatting just before we came in. Um, with, you know, we loved Willys at 100, and at 60, we're scared of it. You know, we love stocks, and then they fall. And it's like, oh, no, no, no. We've got to move away from the crowd. Stock's falling. It's called a sale. When Willys has a sale on their turkeys or their chuckles, they never discount chuckles. When they have a sale on their other things, we queue up. They have a sale on the price. We're like, oh, Willys is going bust. Willys is not going bust. It's going to outlive all of us. Commodities, as I said, buy when 100% up. Kumba, there was the Kumba chart as we sat here last year. Uh, it rallied to about 150. Uh, in fact, 180. It's now about 150. There's the rally we saw. Uh, what, in fact, 170. Uh, massive, insane, crazy. 
Commodities is tough. I mean, short answer. So there are the two charts of copper. The first on the left there is the really exciting one. Oh, look what copper's done. That's a, yeah, but take back in time. I mean, we, this is only back to 11. And if we go back to pre-crisis 2006, we've probably got copper up at around 8,000. So copper's a long way off. Why is it running? For a couple of reasons. Uh, one, apparently Donald Trump is going to spend between $500 billion and a $1 trillion on infrastructure spend. Two observations. A, where's he going to pay it from? And B, it's easy to say, it's harder to do. But here's the real story. China spent $1 trillion on infrastructure this year. Because you know what China does? They want to do it, they do it. You know, there are no niceties in China. You're in the way, it's like move. It's not like please move. It's, like, it's not like go to the court and get, it's just like get out the way. Donald Trump's going to find being president a lot harder than being a chief tweeter in control. So <laughs> the commodity boom has been real. The key thing is, is that the demand has not come back to the level it was. And more importantly, oversupply remains a problem pretty much across the commodity basis, oversupply remains fundamentally real. What we have seen, though, is some of it move out. We've seen some demand picking up China uh, uh, to a degree, America to a slightly lesser degree. We've certainly seen the, 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 some of the supply come out of the equation, although not in iron ore and places like that, um, and I'll touch on oil in a moment. My sense is if you're, if you're looking for commodities of the diversified bulletin is by head and shoulders, you're better. I know Anglo's done better in price, but what is Anglo's? Diamonds, platinum. Key thing with diamonds. Firstly, if you do it right, you buy one diamond in your life. <laughs> and that is, and I know there's seven billion people. Oh no, only half of you buy diamonds. So there's three and a half billion diamonds, but you only buy one, unless you got Cartier on both wrists and now you want to, but you get the story. The other trick is you can make fake diamonds. And you know what? Unless she tries to cut a window with it, she'll never know. If my wife is listening, her diamond is real, promise. <laughs> so I'm not a fan of Anglo, haven't been for 20 odd years. Platinum miners. So platinum gets interesting. Platinum is the one commodity that hasn't moved. I mean, it has, but it's still at crazy levels. Platinum hasn't moved and it's a real commodity in that we use it, as opposed to diamonds and gold. And, you know, we use coal and stuff. But platinum's a real, real commodity, and it hasn't responded. Implats is a safe one. Lonman, we were chatting just before we came in. Is some, you know, make no mistake, you go buy a platinum mine, it's going to be a bumpy, scary journey. But you look at them, and you look at the valuations, and you look at where platinum is, and you take some, 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 some high-risk view in it, and I think there might be some space for some platinum there. But a couple of things. Firstly, this is not for widows and orphans. This is not for your great-great-grandmother who's 92 years old. Um, this is not for your bottom drawer. You don't buy this for your three-year-old and stick it in their bottom drawer so they can have it when they're 18. It might not be there when they're 18. This is trading stuff as distinct from investing. Oil, yeah, oil. Oil is stuck between 40 and 55. Forget about OPEC. OPEC's day in the sun was the 70s. OPEC, Neil Diamond, 70s, big decade. No more. The young folks have no idea who Neil Diamond is. I mean, you're crying into his pretzels and stuff. So let's quickly look at the last OPEC deal. Aside from the fact that historically, the number of months that an OPEC nation has adhered to their, their quota on average, they adhere to it 15% of the time, 1, 5% of the time. This latest OPEC deal has a small little problem. It says to Libya and Nigeria, you guys are having a tough time. You don't have to adhere to quotas. <laughs> so what happens when the price goes up? Libya and Nigeria just open the taps and pump more. Of course they do. Iran in the same kettle. The problem with the whole oil story is that people cheat. Because you can try and boost the price and get more bang for your buck, or you can just pump more at lower prices. The biggest issue is the frackers in America. A fracker can turn a well on to 50% capacity in about 90 hours, 100% capacity in seven days. They can turn that well off in 36 hours. In other words, they've got a price point. Above it, they're pumping. Below it, they're not. The only way we're going to get oil back at 100 is if we can get the demand to such a level that the frackers are at 100% capacity. That's not happening anytime soon. 
Short answer, if you really want to, there's an oil ETN. Oil is stuck where it is. I, be thankful, hey? Oil at 100 bucks, petrol would be 21. Oil is where it is right now. 40, might go to 38, sit time 55, might go to 57. It's happy in that range. That's where oil stays for now. Interest rates locally, no change. We might start to see interest rates coming down second half of next year. Small baby steps, quarter percent, 25 point decreases. That would require some growth to come back. That would require some inflation to come down. Inflation will be coming down, uh, particularly if we get a slightly stronger rand. But the key point is the worming out of that impact of the drought. As the drought works out of the equation, we might actually start to see some negative inflation in the food space. That's a significant part of the basket, of course. Um, so I think we'll start seeing inflation coming down, uh, and therefore we might start to see some interest rates coming down at the same time, locally. But that'll happen next year. It'll happen very, very slowly. Europe, no change. Drachi, uh, Super Mario announced today that his quantitative easing continues to the end of next year. Uh, and that he will start scaling it down from April. It's currently 60 billion euros per month, and in April he will start scaling it down, unless he changes his mind, in which case he may scale it down earlier, he may scale it down later, who knows. The point is Europe... Europe is muddling along. U.S. interest rates will go higher. Janet Yellen and her team will raise interest rates next week. What we've seen is inflation is starting to come into the U.S., Everyone thinks it's a sudden occurrence and happened in the last few weeks since the election. In truth, if you go back to June, we were starting to see inflation coming through in the payrolls. The U.S. is starting to get inflation. They were such a massively low base, but we're starting to see some inflation in the U.S. That will be good for U.S. Uh, uh, businesses. Inflation gives you some pricing power. And it does mean that we'll start seeing interest rates heading higher. Understand that at current levels of interest rates in America of between quarter and half a percent, their long-term average for interest rates in America is three and a quarter. They are 100 miles from getting to the average, never mind exceeding it. But we will start seeing some inflation. We will see. So interest rate increase from Janet Yellen and her team uh, next week. And then I think during the course of next year, maybe two, but probably just one, maybe in the second half of the year. They're going very, very carefully. Um, they don't want to get too, too, too far ahead of the curve. China, no change. Same slide I had last year for China. Everyone's worried about China, end of the world, growth at only whatever percentage, etc., etc. China is a machine. The current story freaking everyone out is apparently they have a trillion dollars of bad loans in China on the banks. So how does China solve that problem? They take all the bad loans, they put them into a bank, they create a bad bank. How do they fund a trillion dollars? China's got trillions and trillions of dollars of US debt. So they take a trillion dollars of, of US T-bills, they take a trillion dollars of bad debt, they put it in a bad bank. How long does it take China to do this? About as long as it took me to explain it. <laughs> they don't have to go to Congress. They don't have to go on TV and explain it. They just do it. That's the point of China. So do they have a trillion dollars? I don't know. Is it two trillion? Maybe it is. Should we worry about it? No, because China won't let it crash their economy because they don't have to. They can solve the problem by creating this toxic zombie bank type thing, stick it in a cupboard somewhere and forget about it. And that's what they do with everything, with their infrastructure spend. And, you know, the whole story, they've got, they've got ghost cities with no one living in it. Yes, they have. Why? Because they have 400 million people that they want to move from peasantry rural into the cities. But you can't move them until you've got the city. So what would we do? Well, we would spend 10 years counting the 400 million people. <laughs> then we would spend 10 years deciding where to move them, not in my backyard, hey? Then we would spend another, uh, you know, China just says we've got 400 million people. Uh, so what do we need? We need cities of 4 million. We need, oh, we need a whole lot of cities. Well, please build. How many people live in Joburg? 4.5 million? You know that in China, if you are a city of 4.5 million people, you're not a top 100 city. If you live in Joburg's equivalent in China, your city isn't the 100th biggest city in China. They are moving. So the fact that they've got a city that can accommodate a million people and nobody lives there, China doesn't care because they've got the people who will live there. And understand, they've done it already. <clears throat> In the last 12 years, they've taken 350 million people from the rural areas, from poverty, and moved them into cities. 
give them accommodation, high-speed trains, etc., etc., etc. The whole idea that China is cheap labor, no more. China is no longer cheap labor. China is now skilled labor. The difference is China is massively skilled labor, way more skilled labor than many. You want cheap labor, you now go to Vietnam, Cambodia, you go to the Southeast Asian countries, you don't go to China. You like China, there's the ETN from Deutsche Bank. I'm stressed that it's an ETN and it is Deutsche Bank. If Deutsche Bank goes bust, I don't think it will, what happens to that ETN? Honest answer, not a clue. <laughs> so maybe, maybe... Uh, Richmond, maybe Discovery, just NASPASS. NASPASS is a China story. The USA, yeah, so, uh, so Trump wins. <laughs> I don't know what that means, to be perfectly honest, except that, I mean, I don't know what that, I, I, it's going to be the craziest four years of our entire life. So, so Michael Moore said it best. He said Trump won't even last two years. He said because he's so brazen and out there and completely crazy, he will do something impeachable by the 1st of February and they'll have him out in two years. And he then follows it up. He says, don't get me wrong, every president has done something impeachable, but they crafty and they hide it. Donald Trump will do it on Twitter. <laughs> he will do something impeachable and he will tweet about it. So Donald Trump. Yeah, but whatever. So what's happening? So will he close borders? Is he going to build a wall? No, he's not going to build a wall. There's not enough cement in the world to build the wall. Um, rate increases are coming. The economy continues to grow. The key thing is the closing of the borders. And I'm going to come back to that, so I'll park that there for now. You know what? Countries survive in spite of. What he will do is cut taxes. He says he will. Uh, how are they going to fund that? That's not his problem because he won't get two terms, so that's the next president's problem. Cutting taxes, that's good, right? More money in the economy, more money being spent, companies making more money, more expansion. Of course, not expansion beyond the borders of America, that would be illegal. Um, he's talking about freeing up the banks from their legislation and all of their restrictions, Dob, uh, Franks and the like. Uh, will he do it? Don't know. If he does, very good for banks. Easier to make money. You can fire all of your compliance and regulators, and then they'll start going bust again. But that's fine. They'll make more money in the process. Will he spend $500 billion to $1 trillion US dollars on infrastructure spend? I don't know, because with respect, that's what Obama said he was going to do, and he found it a little bit harder to actually do it. But certainly in the immediate, in what it seems, he'll probably be good for American economy. Certainly the stock market is agreeing with that at this point of time. The dollar has strengthened massively. The dollar index is at highs. It has never been at before. It is at record levels. Ultimately, that's bad for America. They're going to need to temper that and try and get some dollar weakness in. It's going to be hard. But that dollar weakness plays into my RAND strength story as well. You want to own America? You've got the core shares, S&P 500. I own it at the moment, but I own it as a trade, not an investment. My preferred is a Deutsche Bank uh, worldwide, currently 64% into America. Quick point, that is again Deutsche Bank, but it is an ETF, not an ETN, which means that Deutsche Bank physically holds the shares in a separate special purpose vehicle. If Deutsche Bank goes bust, those shares are still there. I can claim my net asset value. How does it work? No idea, because never, we've never had a major issuer of ETFs go bust before. Will it be messy? Yes. Very messy. But if you're a long-term holder, don't stress it. The core shares versus the Deutsche Bank US, the core shares slightly cheaper and is S&P 500. The Deutsche Bank is the MSCI 600 which means there's extra companies, but the overlap is about 96%. People who are worried about the current bull market, so this is now actually very out of date, because this is from October 31, and since then we've added about another 12% to the indices. So people will tell you that we are in duration terms in the second longest bull market in America, and in terms of performance, the third best bull market ever, and therefore it must end. I say they lack ambition. Why can't this bull market be the longest and the highest? Something we can tell our kids about one day. The short answer is that this market, compared to, well, compared to the 80s, is, is doing all right. Compared to the bull market of the 90s, this thing hasn't even started warming up yet. 
And in terms of duration, it's getting long in the tooth. But look what we had in the preceding decade, the two worst financial crises in over 50 years or 60 years in, the, in, in America. In fact, the two worst, the only worst collapses in America was 1929. Don't know if anyone remembers it. I have no memory of it, but I've read the books. <laughs> Can we make the argument that having had the worst two crashes in living memory, that perhaps having the best bull market is reasonable? I think so. I, look, maybe I'm wrong. I, look, I'm talking my book. I own ETFs that cover that. But I remain bullish on the US, have done for years, and off it goes and carries on tracking. More than happy with US. European Union, yeah, so negative low rates. QE, as I said, Super Mario confirmed today that quantitative easing continues. They continue to muddle along. They were too late on their quantitative easing, way too late. Um, Brexit, yeah, is a problem. German elections next year, French elections next year, Italian referendums on the Sunday just passed. Europe is looking politically stressed, I'm being polite here, and economically, so their pockets. Germany is doing brilliantly well, always has. Uh, but broadly, the European economy continues to struggle, particularly the Greeces, the Italys. And we think Italy, uh, who's Italy? Italy is a top 10 economy in the world in terms of GDP. France as well. So I think France is now four. So it's America, China, Japan, France, United Kingdom, Germany. If you put the EU together, they're behind America, ahead of China. But they just haven't got it going yet. They haven't got it strong enough. The quantitative, quantitative easing, which we know works because America did it and it worked there, was too late to the party. It will work, but Europe still doesn't excite me. There is an ETF on Europe, but again, I prefer the Deutsche Bank worldwide. It has 11% Europe and 7% UK exposure built into it. Here's perhaps the big story of 2016 and perhaps the big story going forward. Uh, that there is Ms. Le Pen, who came third in the French elections of 2019. Uh, understand there were nine people. The way uh, French do their elections is everyone stands and then the two winners go head to head. She came third with almost 18% of the vote in 2012. She's currently leading the polls in the French polls. Not that that tells us anything. In fact, if you're leading the poll, that you, you don't want to be leading the poll anymore. You want to be coming second or third in the poll, perhaps. But what are we seeing with Brexit, with Trump, with Le Pen, uh, with what Italy voted? Belgium is the outlier. So Belgium had a right-wing radical ch chappy standing for president. In Belgium, president is an honorary position. All you do is get to cut some ribbons and drink tea with the queen. They had a rabid right wing of standing. He lost. The point is, he got 47% of the vote. He did lose, but he did do quite very well in the story. What are we seeing? We're seeing a shift to the right. We're seeing a shift to nationalism. This is to be expected in a sense, because what have we had pretty much uh, uh, since the 70s and the end of the Vietnam War was a swing towards the left, a swing towards liberalism. That pendulum goes one side, it will go the other side. It is swinging back towards nationalism. This is not something that is a short-term phenomenon. It is something that will roll out over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. What are the real implications for it? Closing borders, closing trade, you can't come, you're different. We've seen it with Trump. We've seen it with Brexit. It's what Le Pen wants. It's what everyone wants. The problems are that person's fault, not my fault. And there's real stories. I tweeted an image today. Medium household income in America has gone sideways since 1984. For the first time in the history of America, children are not richer than their parents. Never happened before. The problem is, is that they blame the Mexicans and the Chinese and the Canadians. That's not fair. The person you blame is your politicians. So we, there are real grievances. The blame has been proportioned in the wrong place. The problem with closing borders, closing trade, is that capitalism at its core is about freedom of moving. Moving IP, moving people, moving money, moving your business, taking your factory in Colorado and saying, you know what, Mexico is a better deal and moving it to Mexico. Because that's what capitalism does. It goes to where it makes the most profit. Apple 
if they do, uh, 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 Trump wants Apple to make their fancy computers and iPhones, etc., in America. Can they do it? Of course they can. What does it cost? Doubles the price of an iPhone. Is Apple going to double the price? Apple would love to double the price of an iPhone. But they want that double to be their profit, not to pay American workers. They want to build the iPhone as cheap as possible. Currently, they use Foxconn in China. Foxconn is becoming too expensive, so they're investigating Southeast Asia. These implications are not 2017 implications. They're 2017 headlines. But longer term, if we see a continue, if we see a close of borders, if we see Trump nixing NAFTA, if we see Le Pen coming in and closing the French borders, and it's, there are implications down the road, and they are not good. But they are further down the road. It's not end of world. I'm not telling you that we're going to collapse into the sun and everything goes horrible. It's just that the global GDP, that boom that we have seen in the last three, four decades, is going to tarnished to a degree as we start to blame the other people and we start to close borders to people, to money, to IP, to everything else. So 2017, offshore and local. The last couple of years I've said offshore only. I am, as I said earlier, I'm starting to get excited by local. The RAND strength will take some shine off because, it's, you know, in a sense, 70 odd percent of the earnings of our top 40 companies comes from offshore. So if the RAND goes stronger, their earnings take a bit of a hit. Um, but I think they're going to do well enough in terms of growth. They've been beaten down. We've seen the bounce out of Steinhoff today. I expect some of those other uh, UK assets, such as Breit and the others, to get bounces at, you know, over the next three, six, 12 months as they start to do updates and results as the like. Um, and of course, the local stocks within that will start to do better. The ShopRites, uh, the Woolies, uh, MTNs, I suppose, as much as it pains me to say it. Um, the US remains the economy of note. Commodities have run, uh, they've run a heck of a lot. Absolutely, they have. I think there's space. I touched on some of those. Uh, next year will be incredibly noisy politically locally. It will be incredibly noisy politically in well, America with their tweeting president um, and in France with their election. You know, they're politicians. Eh? Best thing to do, turn the TV off. So let's get on to some hard stuff and stop dallying around the bush. For American exposure, CSP 500, the new core shares ETF. The RAND will take some shine off it, but I expect the, the move in the index to do better. I think we can do easy 15% on the S&P 500. If the RAND strengthens 6 or 8%, we're ahead of the curve. If it strengthens 20, we're no longer ahead of the curve. Uh, DB World remains my preferred. I don't go for the niche ones. I go for the broad one. Uh, locally, CSEW 40. The reason I take the core shares equal weighted is because it's equal weighted. I don't get 17% NASPAS. Your Satrix 40 ETF has been beaten this year. Your core shares equal weighted 40 is like muddled along and done quite fine um, because it hasn't got 17% exposure to NASPAS. When NASPAS runs, Satrix 40 wins. When NASPAS falls, core shares 40 wins. My methodology is always simple. If I can get an equal weight, I will get the equal weight over market cap weighting. Always. And the math suggests that the equal weight does better for you. Uh, for the rain, Tongart is my preferred, with Quantum as your second pick in that space. Uh, quantum, and now I've completely gone blank on the price, um, but I'll pick up some Quantums next week. That's your trade for the rain. Uh, ShopRite and Woolies for retail. ShopRite because it's the best retail operation around. Remember when MassMart came? Sorry, Walmart came, bought MassMart. And I remember interviewing Wati Bisson. Uh, I got to call him Mr. Basson because Whitey's a weird name in this country. <laughs> so I say to him, Mr. Basson, do you think that uh, Walmart can teach us some lessons about retail? And the man laughed so loud, he like was spitting out of his nose, live on, on wireless noch. And he says to me, young man, I think we're going to teach those Americans some lessons about retail. So far, the score is knockout. Whitey wins. Where's, where's Walmart in this? Where, 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 they, they know where. They, they did some special deals and then they completely disappeared. We've got top retailers. Woolies, not because I suddenly think rich people are going to start shopping at Woolies again. They will to a degree. But because Woolies is just offering, I think, valuations that are humongously attractive. And Woolies has always been one of my top stocks to own in a core portfolio. 
Bulletin for your mining, which is more of your energy play than anything else, not because I'm expecting energy to go through the roof, but because Bulletin makes large amounts of money with oil at $30, never mind 40 plus. They own, along with Rio Tinto, the iron ore space. They make money at $18 a ton, uh, the rest, and uh, Rio makes it about 20, and the rest of the market makes it about 35 dollars a ton. So yes, Kumba loves iron ore at this price, but uh, Billiton loves it a whole truck more. And then a plat miner, if you really want to have something nice and uh, head on the block type thing, plat in plats, Lonman, if you, look, either are brave. Lonman might be the slightly braver one. The reason I say that is because the issues which led to Marikana they're not really being resolved as well as they should. They got the 12,500 Rand, but, I mean, Lonman promised in 2005 to build 10,000 low-cost houses for their staff. They haven't built them yet, 11 years later. I know, it's hard to build a house. It's not that hard to build a house. Those problems have not gone away. And Armku is, is, is very radical, and Armku is the union in Lonman. By, by, I think they've got 86% representation uh, in, in Lonman. Uh, the National Union of Mine Workers is just nowhere. Why? Because they never looked after their workers. Keep your ETFs, always. Max out your tax-free account, always. That always goes without saying. The beaten bunch, of which, uh, you know, uh, so what are they? Steinhoff, uh, uh, Breit, uh, Woolies, touched on. Richmond, not so bad. Capco, I mean, are they going to bounce in 2017? It's a tough call. So Capco, toughest of all. Steinhoff already started to bounce a bit. Uh, Breit, I think, will come through. Bottom, they're going to find life harder. Steinhoff less so because they've boogied off and bought mattresses in America and mattresses in Australia. That'll help them to a degree. They've got French assets. If Le Pen wins, that'll be interesting. Uh, Breit is very much in the UK. And the UK is going to find it tough. This Brexit is going to be a complicated process. It's going to be difficult. We know, that, we know what the British government wants. They want closed borders for people, open borders for trade. Not going to happen. Hollande has said, no chance on earth. Angela Merkel has said, no chance on earth. You, you can't have your cake and eat it. You have cake or you eat your cake. You can't have both. And I think Britain's going to find the harsh realities of that. It's not the end of the world for them. But it does make things tougher for them. It does mean that British assets are going to have tougher times. But they've been so massively beaten down. So if you've looked at Steinhoff and always said, I love it, but it's too expensive. Or you've looked at Brayton and said, best stock in the world, but too expensive. Or you've looked at Capco and said, that's a lovely stock, but man, the price is crazy. You've got an opportunity. Do you have to rush today? No. Look, you've had six months already, five months. Is there a mad rush? No. But these are quality companies at attractive prices. And if they don't bounce in 2017, then maybe 18, then maybe 19. Remember, investing is about the decades. When you tell your great-grandchildren that you bought Capco at 50 Rand, they won't believe you. It's just going to be a scary ride for a while. It's not going to happen in a hurry. And then quickly, last point, an IPO, which is coming up fairly soon, uh, Premier Fishing. IPOing at five rand, I don't, it's not an IPO, it's a private placement, so I don't know how broad the availability is. So fishing is weird. On, on, on the surface, I don't like it. If ever you've been fishing, right, one of two things happens. You either catch more fish than you can eat in a lifetime, or you can spend a month and never catch a single fish. But these folks are different because they've got quotas. And the thing with Premier is they fill their quotas. They've got Rob, Rock Lobster and Abalone, which is high-end. They've got impeccable, the best BE credentials in the space uh, compared to INJ and uh, Oceana. Um, Premier, if, they, if I can get some at five rand, I will buy them at five rand, and I'll probably sell them at seven rand, 58 bucks or so within weeks, months, or years, or something like that. I don't know when it's coming. I know it's soon, and I don't know how they will be doing it. But if you can get Premier fishing at five rand, Grab some, it will be fun. What I have not mentioned here this evening is gold. Because I don't understand gold. I wear a platinum reading ring. No diamonds, no gold. I don't get gold. Gold will go up, gold will go down. It's, it's, it's the most crazy, insane commodity. I have no idea 
if the end of the world comes, apparently you want to own gold. I think you want to own water and pumpkin seeds. But I'm preempting that because I know that at least five of you are going to come and say, what do you think about gold? My answer is, I don't think about gold. Never. Not even when I'm going to bed at night, not when I wake up, not when I have nightmares. I don't think about gold. If you think about it, brilliant, whatever gold says to you, do it. And here's my last prediction, which I got wrong last year, because I thought they're coming to the Northern Cape. They're going to do 1,000 miles an hour. The current record is like a fraction of that. They caught it. They ran out of money. They didn't come. So I was wrong about that prediction. But they are coming this October, coming up. They're going to come. They're going to break the land speed record. They're here in October. The best story about this engine, it has two F-type Jag engines in the vehicle to pump the fuel. Not to make it go fast, to pump the fuel. I am not a petrol head, but that I want to be there and see. That's the guy who set the record in the 1980s. That is going to do 1,000 miles an hour up in the salt pans in the Northern Cape. It's going to be hot. It's going to be 45 degrees. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be there. If you're on Twitter, go vote. So here's the thing. The wisdom of the crowds, hey? They got uh, Brexit wrong and they got Trump wrong. But hey, we forgive them that. Last year when I said, folks, what did you think? 54% the market would be down. And it was. And that's fair because it was only down a little bit. So even those who were wrong were only wrong by a smidgen. The question now is, what about next year? So get onto Twitter. Have your say. We'll come back next year and see how smart you folks are. So far, 70% are saying 2017, we're going to be green. I think they're right. Of course, I'm biased. A, I asked the question. More importantly, I think it's going to be green as well. Quickly, lawyers, always. <laughs> and then I'll go back to that. Uh, so, ladies and gents, that is my five cents worth. I go back to where I started, which is, tells you more about me than the future. What I do promise to do is come back here next year and review my, 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 my uh, suggestions and postpone suggestions for 2018. And I want to quickly finish with a few quick points. Uh, huge thanks, and I'm not going to name names because I'll miss out names, to the JC team, who there are a few lurking and the rest have already left, uh, to the Just One Lap team, of which there's one lurking and the rest are not here at all. Uh, but most important, a thanks to you folks. I love presenting. This is the best hour I've had all week. But if there was no one here, it wouldn't be any fun. So it's important that folks come, and you do, you support us, you come to the Power Hours, you download the videos, uh, and for that, a huge, huge, huge thank you. Uh, and then all that remains is I hope that in 2017, your politicians keep quiet, your portfolio gets bigger, and that you have absolutely, splendidly brilliant holidays between now and then. Ladies and gents, thank you for your time, thank you for your support. <laughs>